Well, if it's, if it's okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, challenges of the 21st uh, Century Series here at the European Center at Harvard. And thank you to the European Commission for sponsoring this series, which uh, or helping to sponsor this series, which has had uh, a host of uh, very, very impressive talks over the years, which many of you uh, have been to. I'm Ken Rogoff. I'm a professor of economics uh, here at Harvard University. And uh, I'm uh, here first to uh, have the incredible privilege of introducing the vice president of the commission responsible for economic and monetary affairs in the euro. And the short title is the most important economic official in the Eurozone, uh, Ali Ren, uh, who's uh, had certainly an extraordinary uh, career. Um, sorry, we're uh, microphone on now, I guess. Um, and uh, he, he joined the College of Commissioners in February 2010 and uh, became the vice president of the commission in 2011. And before that, uh, had, had a pretty interesting job, too, as the uh, head uh, <coughs> commissioner for enlargement uh, for uh, November 2004 to February 2010, and uh, w oversaw the accession of countries, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, during, the, during this period. <coughs> and he was uh, the head of cabinet of Commissioner Erki Lykanen, I apologize if I'm not saying the Spitals. governor's name well, uh, from 1998 to 2003. Uh, he has uh, academic connections, a uh, few. So uh, I'll start with one. From 2000 to 2003, uh, he worked as a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Helsinki. Um, and he was a member of the Finnish parliament from 1991 to 1995 and chaired the Finnish delegation to the Council of Europe. Uh, he was a member of the European Parliament from 1995 to 1996, deputy chairman of the Center Party from 1988 to 94, and chairman of the Center Youth from 1987 to 89. And I think there's something about foot, playing football, too, that might not be in your official uh, CV. Uh, Ali Ren has a uh, DPhil in International Political Economy from Oxford in 1996 and an MA in Political Science from the University of Helsinki in 1983, and from 1982 to 1983, studied economics, international relations, and journalism at McAllister, McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's quite extraordinary to have the vice uh, president of the commission here. There's just a little bit going on uh, back in Europe. Uh, <laughs> And uh, just before uh, Mr. Wren said, sometimes his mind does wander to some of those capitals uh, there. Uh, I, I'm certainly aware of a number of uh, important international meetings recently where the Europeans just don't show up because they're busy at home. And it's really quite a privilege uh, to have uh, the Vice President uh, speaking here at Harvard. So. Um, I'm going to uh, leave it there, but we'll have lots of time for questions uh, afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rogoff, uh, and ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's, uh, first of all, great to be here at, uh, at Harvard, uh, and uh, great to see some uh, old friends uh, in the audience, including uh, Lucas Papademos, uh, with whom we worked uh, quite intens intensively over the years in order to tame the crisis and uh, return back to sustainable growth. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, my CV, in, that seems to be the long version. I, I should uh, revise my bio probably because uh, it sounds like that uh, I've had uh, plenty of uh, temp jobs, uh, which, <laughs> which is probably true, but uh, that's not uh, because of uh, lack of uh, consistency. It's uh, just uh, the, the occasional uh, volatility of uh, electoral support, uh, which has uh, <laughs> shifted me between uh, academia and uh, democratic uh, politics. Uh, and now I'm somewhere in between in, uh, in the European public service, uh, which uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I feel very much uh, home, I must say. You also mentioned uh, McAllister and, uh, and sports. Uh, I have to underline that uh, 
my scholarship uh, to McAllister, McAllister College, uh, Minnesota, was uh, not due to any sports uh, achievements. Uh, <laughs> uh, we only got uh, academic scholarships. Uh, I can prove you the point uh, because uh, in uh, 1983, 82-83, when I was a student at Mac, uh, there was uh, a cartoon, nationwide uh, uh, syndicated cartoon, Dennis the Menace, uh, uh, reflecting the fact that uh, McAllister had uh, lost, uh, had made uh, the U.S. record uh, in losing 53 football games uh, in a row. <laughs> and uh, the father of uh, Dennis the Menace uh, said to Dennis that uh, if you don't behave, he had a football helmet in his, uh, in his head, uh, Dennis, uh, he had done something, something bad, of course, so if you don't behave, uh, I sent you to McAllister. <laughs> <laughs> so I was playing soccer, so not, uh, don't blame me for our football record. So, dear friends, uh, I, must, I very much appreciate uh, the chance to discuss uh, the ongoing economic and political transformation of uh, Europe and of the European Union here. And uh, I'm glad to see that uh, Europe uh, and uh, European affairs uh, still draw such uh, attention. After all, the news over the past few years uh, from the old continent uh, cannot have been exactly an inspiration for deeper European studies. In Europe, uh, too, there have been many voices expressing doubt about uh, the future of uh, the European Union. Some have been even suggesting that uh, the story of uh, European integration might be reaching its uh, final chapter. Let me say right from the start that uh, one does uh, better by not believing in these uh, pessimistic uh, Cassandras. Uh, we tend to say back home that uh, a pessimist is uh, never disappointed, uh, but uh, in the end uh, it is those uh, with uh, patience and uh, determination who will carry the day. And this goes for Europe uh, as well. I am bringing some uh, better news uh, from across uh, the ocean and uh, I'm glad to do so here at uh, Harvard University, which is uh, known for its uh, openness and uh, strong international links uh, and uh, for unique uh, academic and uh, scientific uh, achievements. In the midst of uh, so much worrying news about uh, the economic and political crisis in Europe, uh, one may too easily forget that uh, Europe is uh, still much stronger than often perceived. And I want to point this out uh, deliberately because uh, we get uh, quite, uh, quite strong uh, cycles uh, in uh, media and uh, strong uh, uh, perceptions uh, if we only follow the daily news. Uh, for instance, uh, today's, uh, if you read today's uh, New York Times, uh, you would think that uh, the whole Europe is uh, about uh, uh, gloom and uh, grim times. Uh, we have difficulties, uh, but that's not the only story of <coughs> Europe uh, for the moment. The European Union, with its uh, more than 500 million citizens, uh, is and uh, will still for some time to come be the largest uh, single economic uh, area in the world. And it counts uh, for almost uh, one third of uh, global economic uh, output. The EU is the largest uh, trading partner and uh, source of uh, foreign investment uh, for the US, uh, for China and uh, for many others. And Europe is uh, the world's leading power in development cooperation and uh, Europe's uh, soft power is uh, still a source of stability and progress uh, in its neighborhood uh, and uh, beyond. And most importantly, the European Union continues to do what it has uh, always done best, uh, that is uh, maintaining the longest ever period uh, of uh, peace, freedom and uh, prosperity in the troubled history of uh, Europe. No mean achievement. To be sure, we are today witnessing uh, an extremely fast uh, global economic uh, and uh, political rebalancing between uh, the so-called uh, old and uh, emerging powers. Uh, but it would be a mistake uh, to count uh, Europe uh, out. Uh, <coughs> the European <coughs> Union is here to stay, and I believe uh, this is good news uh, for everyone, not uh, just uh, for Europeans. Of course, uh, this is not to say that uh, we would uh, not have uh, deep problems uh, to deal with uh, 
or that uh, we would have uh, already overcome the economic uh, crisis. Several of our member states uh, still face uh, great challenges uh, in stabilizing their public finances uh, and uh, strengthening their competitiveness. Uh, unemployment is uh, at uh, unacceptable levels uh, in uh, many, if not uh, most, of the 27 member states, uh, which has uh, very serious uh, social and uh, human consequences in our societies. <coughs> the return to growth uh, will be sluggish uh, and uh, slow, as uh, the slide which uh, we should have uh, now. This uh, slide, in fact, uh, portrays uh, this an index of, uh, of gross national product uh, and it, uh, it shows that uh, the crisis hit Europe uh, quite hard. Uh, in other words, uh, we are just about uh, to reach uh, the level of uh, 2007 or 2008 uh, in terms of uh, cross national product uh, in uh, Europe. <coughs> and you have, uh, you have that uh, with uh, thick red lines, uh, and then you have, uh, you have the change, uh, quarterly change uh, in the smaller red line, and uh, GDP growth uh, on a quarterly basis uh, with uh, blue pillars. So we will have uh, a flat uh, end of uh, this year. We have had uh, we have actually in a technical recession for the moment uh, and uh, the end of this year will be flat uh, in spring we still uh, forecast that uh, Europe will start recovering in the third and uh, fourth quarters of uh, 2012. But now it seems that uh, it's quite clear that uh, the recovery is being delayed uh, to next year 2013. And it will continue to be a slow and uh, subdued uh, recovery, which is in fact uh, quite typical after such long financial crisis uh, as we have uh, experienced. In the short term, we have to ensure that uh, the financial markets uh, are stable enough uh, to fuel the engines of uh, growth. Uh, we have had to create uh, financial stabilization mechanisms uh, to provide uh, liquidity to member states uh, that find themselves uh, shut out uh, of the markets uh, so that they have uh, the time they need uh, to pursue essential reforms. We have also completely overhauled uh, Europe's uh, economic governance, uh, that is, uh, the rules and practices uh, for coordinating our member states' uh, economic uh, and uh, fiscal policies. We have engaged uh, in uh, far-reaching structural reforms uh, for growth uh, both at uh, the European level and in individual member states. I'm convinced that uh, all this hard work uh, will start bearing fruit uh, in uh, a not too distant uh, future. And in fact, uh, the first signs uh, are already visible, as I will explain uh, in a moment. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? The build-up of uh, Debt, uh, deficit uh, and uh, imbalances uh, in our economies uh, did not happen overnight, uh, but uh, over many years, uh, as you can see from this uh, chart, uh, especially the years between 2000 and uh, 2008, uh, that was the first eight years of the euro, saw a very re significant uh, build-up of uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances, uh, both in terms of uh, current account uh, deficits and uh, surpluses. Here we have, uh, on the blue color, we have, uh, we have the so-called uh, surplus countries uh, of the euro area, which are basically, uh, you have uh, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Finland, uh, Austria, Luxembourg, uh, and uh, Belgium. And uh, in among the, s s among the deficit countries, uh, you have uh, all the rest uh, in this uh, chart. The rebalancing of the European economy is now underway, but uh, it will inevitably take uh, still quite some time because of the large size of the economic imbalances that were accumulated. The good news is that uh, change is happening across Europe. Uh, reforms uh, to address uh, long-standing weaknesses in uh, product and labor markets, uh, as well as, of course, uh, financial markets uh, contribute uh, to the successful consolidation of uh, public uh, finances uh, and uh, help ensure lasting improvements uh, in competitiveness uh, in countries uh, that have been running current account uh, deficits. 
For instance, uh, in Italy and Spain, there is uh, a wave of reforms uh, going on already for some time. And uh, Spain, for instance, uh, is uh, just about uh, to finalize uh, the banking sector reform, which will be concluded uh, this uh, Friday. And uh, in parallel, Spain is uh, working very intensively for the moment uh, uh, in order to present uh, a reinforced uh, national reform program, which will include uh, a number of uh, new reforms, uh, ranging from uh, product markets to labor markets, uh, pension systems uh, to taxes. Although the macroeconomic outlook uh, for Europe uh, is still bleak, uh, there are signs that uh, the imbalances are gradually narrowing, helped uh, also by the adjusting unit uh, labor costs, uh, which uh, I will show in the next uh, slide, which is now on the screen. <coughs> for instance, uh, in uh, Ireland, uh, there's been uh, a reduction of 20% uh, uh, since the peak of uh, 2008 uh, in uh, unit labor costs. Uh, and uh, thanks to restoring its uh, competitiveness uh, and uh, growing exports and uh, industrial production, Ireland uh, has been able to reaccess uh, the financial markets, uh, in fact, earlier than envisaged. Portugal, while having uh, social unrest uh, recently, is uh, recording stronger than expected uh, export growth, uh, which is uh, helping to offset uh, weaker domestic uh, demand. And Greece has uh, achieved uh, more than is often recognized uh, in terms of uh, fiscal consolidation and uh, structural reforms. And the Greek government uh, is committed uh, to continue to reform uh, the economy and uh, the country. We have been recently in very intensive negotiations uh, again with uh, the Greek government. Uh, we have a temporary pause, but we will continue shortly and uh, I trust uh, we'll finalize uh, the next round of talks uh, in the coming weeks. But it's not only about uh, deficit countries uh, doing their job. Uh, by the same token, countries with uh, current account uh, surpluses uh, should pursue targeted uh, reforms uh, to move unnecessary constraints uh, on domestic demand uh, and uh, investment uh, opportunities. All of Europe uh, stands to benefit uh, from a more rapid uh, rebalancing of the economy. For instance, uh, Germany has been uh, recommended uh, to allow wage growth uh, in line with uh, productivity, to use its uh, fiscal scope uh, for growth-enhancing investment uh, in education and uh, research, uh, and uh, to enhance uh, participation of uh, women into the labor force. We have uh, every reason to believe that uh, Germany is uh, pursuing these uh, recommendations. Uh, and in fact, uh, it is uh, worth noting that uh, recent uh, wage agreements uh, in Germany from last spring foresee average uh, wage increases uh, of uh, around 5% uh, uh, in the coming period. And even, even more so, it's worth noting also that uh, Finance Minister Wolfgang Schäuble, the federal government, have supported uh, this uh, wage increases uh, of uh, this magnitude. Uh, and even the Bundesbank uh, has uh, expressed that uh, it realizes that uh, the inflation rate uh, in Germany has to be somewhat uh, above uh, the average inflation rate uh, in uh, the Eurozone in the, in the coming years. So there is recognition also in Germany that uh, this kind of uh, rebalancing is uh, necessary for the Eurozone economy. So in this context, uh, it is uh, now essential that uh, Euro area member states uh, stay the course of uh, sound fiscal policies uh, and uh, continue with uh, structural reforms uh, in order to create uh, the conditions for investment, uh, sustainable growth and uh, better employment. In this context, uh, one hears uh, often criticism uh, of a too strict uh, implementation of uh, the EU's uh, stability and uh, growth pact uh, and its 3% uh, uh, deficit and 60% uh, uh, debt ratio thresholds. Let me make uh, two points on this. Uh, first, uh, the EU and uh, Euro area are collectively still breaching these uh, thresholds, uh, both thresholds, uh, 
which is, uh, let's face it, uh, a major reason for why the financing of the deficit uh, and debt uh, has become so expensive for many member states. Before those levels are brought uh, on a clearly downward path, uh, their cost of financing will continue to crowd out uh, possibilities uh, for more productive and uh, growth-enhancing use of uh, public and uh, private uh, finance. I trust, uh, I at least hope, uh, that uh, Professor Rogoff uh, could agree that uh, this time is uh, not different uh, either <laughs> as regards uh, these uh, debt levels uh, we are facing in Europe. The second point is that uh, the pact is not stupid. It was reformed uh, for the first time five years ago. Now it was reformed again last year. And uh, it focuses on the structural effort uh, of a member state uh, to correct its uh, excessive deficit. Uh, and uh, thus it allows a differentiation across member states uh, according to their fiscal space uh, and uh, macroeconomic uh, conditions. And this is guiding our economic and fiscal policy coordination and our recommendations uh, addressed uh, to the member states. For instance, uh, take Spain and uh, Portugal concerning Spain this spring in uh, May, June this year. The Commission recommended uh, that uh, the correction of the, of the deadline of uh, the excessive deficit of Spain were to be extended uh, from uh, 2013 to 2014 because of the worse uh, growth out outlook uh, in Spain. Now, I would expect that uh, we will do the same for Portugal. And the reason is that uh, both countries uh, have done the structural fiscal effort uh, measured in euros uh, even if they didn't meet the nominal targets. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, their growth outlook uh, has uh, <coughs> clearly significantly worsened. So the point is that the countries have done the <coughs> medium-term uh, structural effort, uh, while at the same time, uh, despite uh, their all, all efforts, uh, their macroeconomic uh, outlook has worsened, uh, and uh, they should not be, under Gimme, punished uh, because of uh, that. Uh, now, this uh, work is uh, slowly bringing results, uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we have the fiscal deficits uh, from 2004 until 2013 here. You could have uh, several messages of this picture. One is that uh, the good times were wasted uh, in the previous decade. Uh, that's one message. Uh, but uh, my point is rather related to the last uh, couple of years, uh, so that uh, in uh, 2009 and 10, we had 6% uh, uh, deficit uh, in Europe, uh, in the euro area. Last year, 2011, it was brought down to 4%. Uh, this year, we will be close to 3%. Uh, and uh, next year, we expect that uh, we will be uh, around 3% uh, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal deficit. At the same time, uh, the level of uh, public debt in Europe uh, has increased uh, from 60% uh, uh, five years ago to 90% uh, on average, from 60 to 90% uh, in just uh, four or five years. And um, I recall that uh, there is, uh, there is uh, very serious research uh, which uh, points out uh, to the correlation between weaker economic uh, dynamism uh, when uh, the level of uh, public debt uh, reaches uh, 90 percent. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that uh, we have to take very seriously in uh, Europe. Even the German public debt is uh, at the level of 83 percent uh, for the moment. So uh, asking Germany to do uh, excessive, uh, extensive fiscal stimulus uh, may be excessive to be asked uh, from Germany in the current uh, context. To allow time for the countries uh, affected by persistent uh, tensions in the sovereign bond markets uh, to enact uh, much needed reforms, uh, Europe's uh, financial backstops uh, have uh, also been strengthened. Uh, the temporary uh, European financial stability facility was set up uh, in May 2010 for three years, uh, and it has been providing financial assistance to Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, and uh, Portugal. A new, robust and uh, permanent uh, firewall 
what is called uh, the European Stability Mechanism or ESM will become operational in October, in a few weeks, uh, which is uh, nine months uh, earlier than initially planned. And the leaders of the euro area have committed uh, to use uh, the available instruments uh, in an efficient uh, and uh, flexible manner for short-term market stabilization. This means, uh, in particular, a readiness to intervene in bond markets uh, when necessary, following a request uh, by a member state uh, and uh, subject to strict uh, conditionality. These tools of uh, financial stabilization are obviously complemented uh, by the bold and, uh, say, potentially historic uh, decision of the European Central Bank uh, to introduce a scheme for outright uh, monetary transactions. This uh, OMT scheme allows the ECB to buy government bonds uh, on the secondary market, uh, provided uh, the member state concerned uh, is covered uh, by a program under the European Stability Mechanism, uh, either active or precautionary, which would allow for the possibility of uh, primary market uh, purchases. Even if uh, Mario Draghi might not uh, admit uh, in public, uh, but uh, this implies uh, coordinated division of labor between the member state governed uh, European Stability Mechanism uh, on the one hand uh, and uh, the European Central Bank uh, on the other hand, uh, so that uh, it falls to the ESM, which is run by the member states, uh, to intervene if necessary in primary markets, uh, while it falls uh, to the ECB to intervene uh, if necessary and uh, if uh, the ECB so decides uh, on an independent basis uh, to intervene in the secondary markets. Here there is much talk about uh, conditionality. I find uh, it is uh, an essential element of uh, this uh, package in order to ensure that uh, this kind of uh, short-term market interventions uh, can help uh, reduce uh, bond yields uh, in a lasting manner. And uh, conditionality would be based uh, on the EU's uh, country-specific recommendations uh, and uh, set out uh, in a memorandum with uh, specific uh, policy objectives uh, and uh, a clear timeline. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the more medium to long term, uh, we have uh, engaged uh, in a very far-reaching process of uh, rebuilding Europe's uh, economic and uh, monetary union. We have, in fact, uh, had to work uh, in uh, two different uh, timescales, uh, both uh, as uh, firefighters uh, <coughs> on uh, financial and economic uh, crisis management uh, in the very immediate uh, to short term, and uh, then uh, towards more medium to long term uh, as uh, architects uh, in order to rebuild uh, the architecture of uh, the economic and uh, monetary union. I recall one European statesman uh, saying uh, in July 2010, that's uh, over, three, uh, over two years ago, I mercifully do not mention the name, but uh, this uh, statesman said that uh, that was after the first Greek package uh, and uh, after the creation of the European Financial Stability Facility, he said that uh, now the firefighters have done their job, uh, it's turned for the architects. Uh, well, I agree with him uh, in half. Uh, it's uh, necessary that uh, we rebuild uh, the architecture of uh, the EMU, but at the same time, uh, sorry to say, we have to continue with, uh, with our firefighting activities uh, still for some time to come. And. Uh, we have already, as I said earlier, improved the functioning of uh, EMU, but it's clear that uh, further changes are needed uh, to address uh, the weak spots uh, of its uh, original design. The debt crisis has shown that uh, EMU, as it was conceived and uh, implemented uh, in the 1990s, uh, was uh, clearly incomplete. It had uh, systemic uh, shortcomings. Uh, Partly the economics profession did not see what, uh, what was coming, partly the political leaders uh, in the environment of uh, unanimity rule could not agree on a first best solution, but had to resort uh, to a second best uh, solution. For a number of reasons, uh, 
the same kind of progress uh, that was done uh, on a monetary union was not achieved uh, on, a, on an economic union with uh, a corresponding level of uh, integration among euro area countries uh, in uh, budgetary policies, uh, debt issuance, uh, financial sector regulation and supervision, and so on and uh, so forth. And therefore, to launch the work for future institutional reforms, uh, four presidents of uh, the European institutions uh, presented in June a report uh, called uh, Towards a Genuine Economic and Monetary Union. It identified uh, four essential building blocks uh, for further integration. I just mentioned this. Uh, first, uh, an integrated uh, financial framework. Uh, second, uh, an integrated uh, budgetary framework. Uh, third, uh, an integrated uh, economic policy framework. Uh, and fourth, uh, ensuring democratic legitimacy and uh, accountability. On the first block, uh, the Commission presented uh, two weeks ago its proposals for a banking union. We propose uh, shifting the supervision of uh, euro area banks uh, to the European level, that is uh, essentially to the European Central Bank. Uh, this would be subsequently combined uh, with uh, other steps, uh, such as uh, integrated uh, bank crisis management uh, or crisis resolution and uh, deposit uh, protection. Ensuring that uh, bank supervision and uh, resolution across the euro area meet high standards uh, should uh, reassure both uh, the public uh, and the markets uh, that a common high level of uh, prudential regulation is uh, consistently applied uh, to all euro area banks. This means that uh, if banks uh, get into difficulties uh, in the future, the public uh, should have the confidence uh, that uh, ailing banks uh, will be restructured uh, or closed, uh, and thus uh, minimizing the costs uh, for the taxpayer. This future system will help build uh, the necessary trust uh, between member states, uh, which is uh, a necessary condition for the introduction of uh, any common financial arrangements uh, to protect uh, depositors uh, and uh, support uh, orderly resolution of uh, failing banks. We are not quite yet about uh, to create uh, the equivalent of uh, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation in Europe, uh, but uh, I cannot and I, I, I have no reason to deny that uh, the US uh, arrangements uh, have been uh, a source of inspiration for our work uh, in this field. Once uh, the single supervisory mechanism uh, is in place, uh, the direct uh, recapitalization of banks uh, from the European stability mechanism uh, becomes uh, possible. And uh, next, uh, we will need to consider further steps uh, towards uh, a common resolution authority. And finally, at the later stage, uh, a more closely integrated uh, deposit guarantee system can be considered. I will not dwell deeper on the second and third block, uh, that's the fiscal and uh, the economic union, we will publish a, blue a blueprint uh, for the way forward uh, later on this fall in this regard. Uh, but uh, to give you an idea of uh, how far we are willing to reach, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the State of the Union, that's the sta State of uh, the European Union, addressed uh, by President uh, Barroso on the 12th of uh, September two weeks ago, in which he promised uh, that we'll present uh, a blueprint uh, to identify the necessary tools and instruments, uh, including treaty changes, uh, to complete uh, a genuine economic and uh, monetary union. A fiscal union would need to rest uh, on uh, effective mechanisms uh, to prevent and to correct uh, unsustainable budgetary developments uh, and macroeconomic imbalances uh, in the euro area member states. This could uh, in turn involve uh, coordinated uh, or even a common but limited uh, issuance of uh, public uh, debt. The guiding principle here for the euro area 
has to be that uh, any further mutualization of uh, sovereign risk uh, would uh, need to go hand in hand uh, with uh, deeper integration of uh, budgetary decision making to safeguard uh, against uh, moral hazard uh, and uh, free riding. I think here, next to Boston, it is appropriate to paraphrase uh, the saying, uh, the proverb, uh, no taxation without uh, representation, <laughs> by saying that uh, no mutualization without uh, deeper integration. That's the order of things. Uh, and uh, besides, uh, even if uh, one, one were to be in favor of uh, eurobonds uh, in some form, nobody wants uh, eurobonds uh, to turn into junk bonds uh, <coughs> overnight. Uh, so we'd better make sure that uh, our economic governance uh, is reliable and effective before we rush into further mutualization of uh, sovereign risk uh, through some form of uh, issuance of uh, public uh, debt. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have uh, outlined to you the main elements of uh, the ongoing economic and uh, political transformation of uh, Europe. We are still at uh, rather early stages of the transformation, but uh, much has already been done. It is not uh, easy in many of the member states uh, for their citizens uh, but uh, with uh, the accumulated imbalances uh, we had in <coughs> Europe, uh, there was simply no easy way out. Uh, and uh, we need to remain realistic. Uh, for instance, uh, we cannot expect uh, the euro area to transform itself uh, into a full fiscal union overnight, uh, just like that. Uh, deeper integration needs to be accompanied uh, by strong democratic uh, legitimacy. Far-reaching decisions uh, will inevitably take time, and uh, they need to be thoroughly discussed uh, and uh, agreed in a way that is uh, fully legitimate, uh, especially taking into account uh, the very complex uh, democratic construction that is called uh, the European Union. But please uh, rest assured uh, that we have the sense of direction and the determination to move forward uh, and build uh, what I have called uh, EMU 2.0. It will be a true stability union of uh, both responsibility and solidarity, backed by democratic accountability and uh, capable for sustainable growth uh, and uh, job creation. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> the deeper integration needs to be accompanied uh, by strong democratic uh, legitimacy Far-reaching decisions uh, will inevitably take time, and uh, they need to be thoroughly discussed uh, and uh, agreed in a way that is uh, fully legitimate, uh, especially taking into account uh, the very complex uh, democratic construction that is called uh, the European Union. But please uh, rest assured uh, that we have the sense of direction and the determination to move forward uh, and build uh, what I have called uh, EMU 2.0. It will be a true stability union of uh, both responsibility and solidarity, backed by democratic accountability and uh, capable for sustainable growth uh, and uh, job creation. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much for that very comprehensive and candid uh, discussion of where Europe is and where it's going. Uh, I'm, I, I think any question I have to ask you answered in there somewhere, but I'm going to try to uh, perhaps uh, ask it again. I think I uh, particularly want to start with where you ended with about democratic legitimacy, you know, how, how do you move towards there. Uh, sort of two questions. How far do you think Europe needs to go towards political union in just, you know, say in 75 years? Where does it need to be? What's the, the end game to the political union? And I guess this, the second question is how far does it have to be in, say, 15 or 20 years in order to keep stability uh, of the euro?
thanks for giving us uh, such a long timeline. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very comforting. It's, uh, in fact, uh, the strongest, strongest evidence and proof that uh, the Eurozone and uh, Euro will survive this uh, short, uh, short-term crisis. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, uh, it's a very important, uh, pertinent uh, question how far we should uh, move towards uh, a political union. Here, you may see that uh, the political debate uh, in Europe is just about to start in this regard. Uh, there have been uh, many important uh, interventions uh, and uh, initiatives. Uh, for instance, uh, the Commission President uh, spoke about uh, the Federation of uh, Nation States uh, two weeks ago. And uh, in Germany, there is a serious debate uh, on a political union, and there have been uh, proposals for electing the next uh, commission president uh, uh, from among uh, the candidates of uh, the political parties, political groups uh, of uh, the European Union or of uh, the European Parliament. The French uh, finance minister, Pierre Moscovici, has, uh, has uh, spelled out uh, the F-word uh, federalism in one of his uh, recent uh, speeches. Uh, this shows that uh, things are starting to move, and uh, I would expect that uh, in the next uh, one or two years uh, we will have uh, a very profound and uh, lively debate uh, about uh, the future of uh, political union and uh, democratic uh, legitimacy in, uh, in Europe. I see that in the very short term uh, we need to ensure that uh, we have, uh, I speak uh, obviously very much from my own portfolio point of view, my responsibilities in the economic and uh, financial affairs. Uh, I believe that uh, we have to have uh, a solid and uh, sturdy economic and financial union, or economic and banking union, to supplement uh, the monetary union. That's the immediate challenge. Uh, some things uh, we can do without uh, treaty change, uh, like uh, the banking union, which is very important uh, to break the vicious uh, link between the sovereign and uh, banks, uh, which has been at the root of the crisis. Uh, at the same time, uh, we need to take steps towards a fiscal union, which likely will require treaty changes, uh, and in that context uh, discuss uh, how the Eurozone will work uh, more effectively and uh, more legitimately as uh, a political union. So we went way forward in time. Let me go back in time. Uh, back when the euro was being negotiated, or you know, even when you rep represented Finland uh, in, in Europe, um, what would you have done differently? What would you have told them that you're missing something big? Everybody has something's wrong. I mean, I don't think it's a secret that it didn't get perfect the first time. So, or say Asia was planning to do it. They were planning to have a currency union in Asia or Latin America or Canada, the United States, and Mexico. What would you tell them that you would do differently? I make uh, two points on this. Uh, first, uh, economic uh, economics point, uh, and second, uh, more political, historical point. Uh, the economic point is that uh, I think uh, among the economics profession, both uh, in the United States and uh, in Europe, uh, when the discussion was very lively about uh, the construction of uh, the Economic and Monetary Union, say, 20 years ago, we underestimated, uh, we, we overestimated uh, the challenges uh, related to the, or stemming from the, the theory of uh, optimal currency areas uh, and related to the production structure, while we underestimated uh, the challenges uh, stemming from uh, financial imbalances uh, which uh, might be created uh, by the euro. And uh, I've, been tr I've been trying to trace some uh, research articles that would have uh, pointed out uh, this challenge, uh, but uh, I have not been very successful so far. Ten years ago, you may even <coughs> recall that uh, in 1998-2000, uh, uh, there was discussion about uh, endogenous uh, convergence, uh, which uh, I think uh, very many economists uh, would not take very seriously today. Might have been Nolan. someone here working on that. Ah. The second point is uh, rather related to the political and historical context, uh, which was, uh, you may have to recall that uh, it was uh, in the context of uh, German reunification, where European unification was uh, taking major steps uh, forward. Uh, 
and essentially the then design, I don't say final design, because we have redesigned uh, the EMU already and we keep on redesigning it. Uh, the then design was actually an issue of uh, compromise uh, between Germany and, uh, and France. Uh, and uh, we were left with uh, a rather minimalistic uh, monetary union without a uh, very strong uh, economic union. And I think uh, the past uh, 10 years and at least uh, the past uh, five years have shown that uh, we would have needed uh, the economic union to supplement uh, the monetary union. And that's why we have taken action in order to create uh, the economic union. In fact, uh, I didn't in my opening remarks uh, go too deep on, uh, on the recent reform of uh, economic governance in, uh, in Europe, uh, which uh, basically means uh, three things. Uh, we have uh, we have set up uh, uh, credible uh, fiscal targets uh, in in, <coughs> in order to ensure the sustainability of public finances. Uh, second, uh, we have uh, a mechanism of uh, preventing and correcting macroeconomic imbalances, uh, and third, we have uh, an enforcement system which uh, enables uh, us to really implement uh, these uh, decisions. Um. Let me try the present now. Uh, so Mario Draghi, the head of the ECB, uh, made a very dramatic announcement of the ECB decision uh, to buy unlimited and potentially unlimited amounts of periphery country bonds, anybody's bonds. Um, and uh, that was certainly been welcomed, and I think uh, as part of a number of developments has at least you know, seemed to give optimism recently. Um, I guess one, one thing I had trouble quite understanding uh, is that on the one hand, you want to have conditionality, and you, you yourself have you know, been, been very important in emphasizing the importance of conditionality reform. Uh, on the other hand, you want to show that the euro is going to be strong permanently, and so you need this bailout. Once you, you know, sort of say, we're going to buy in unlimited amounts, what what prevents the moral hazard problem? What sort of keeps the pressure on? And, 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 and it, uh, the head of the ECB did say something. He said, well, we're going to require a program. But it wasn't totally clear to me what kind of program they would have or who would monitor it. When you have an IMF program, it's a very bright line. Admittedly, it moves all the time, but you know, there's a line, you break it once, okay, try again. You break it two or three times and you really don't get money, it's really over. And is the ECB going to do that? Is there a system for doing that? I, I didn't quite understand that amidst the euphoria of his generosity. You're right that uh, the uh, announcement of uh, President Mario Draghi over this uh, unlimited uh, outright uh, transactions uh, was very important uh, in terms of uh, helping to stabilize uh, the situation in the markets in the short term. How the conditionality would work? It would work so that uh, essentially based on uh, the existing, uh, what we call, uh, and I, su I apologize for using some EU jargon because it is uh, almost unavoidable uh, in this context. Uh, so uh, what is called country-specific recommendations. They are recommendations uh, on uh, economic and fiscal policy and structural reforms uh, to each and every member state, uh, tailored uh, for each and every member state, uh, proposed by the Commission and decided uh, by the Council of, uh, of member states. So it has the strongest uh, possible backing in the European Union Council and Commission are, are backing these uh, recommendations. The latest recommendations were, were done, were adopted uh, in July. They are still very much valid, uh, and uh, they go into quite some uh, depth uh, as regards, for instance, uh, restoring competitiveness uh, of uh, any member state of the Union. So this would be the basis of, uh, of conditionality, and uh, then it could be constructed either as uh, a, uh, say, regular program, active program, or as a precautionary program, uh, which has been uh, often the practice of the, of the IMF. There'll be somebody monitoring it. The monitoring would be done uh, by the Commission and the ECB 
and uh, possibly with, uh, with the fund, uh, with the International Monetary Fund, uh, in case uh, the IMF uh, does uh, an independent decision uh, on uh, some form of uh, program and or monitoring in that, uh, in that context. And here I think the issue of, uh, of uh, say, uh, who yields first uh, is uh, somewhat misunderstood in the financial media. There were comment commentaries uh, from the usual pundits uh, uh, in the yellow press of the financial media and some other papers uh, immediately after the decision saying that uh, this conditionality cannot work uh, because uh, if the country will not meet the conditions, uh, the ECB will have to continue financing because otherwise it's such a big risk for the whole euro area. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I believe that uh, the country concerned uh, is in uh, more trouble than the euro area as a whole. And uh, therefore, uh, conditionality uh, has a stronger backing than perceived uh, by, by many pundits, uh, by many columnists uh, in, the, in the financial media. I, I can't help but say, I mean, that obviously that would be more convincing if it happened once. I mean, so if the IMF, not very often, but has cut people off. And uh, I mean, that I think that's a bridge, I guess, you will may have to cross at some point. I, I think unless you keep moving, you know, the line all the time. You're right, uh, of course. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at uh, the recent history of uh, the ECB actions, and I have to put my words very carefully because uh, I may be, they may be haunting me in the future, but... Uh, we don't want that. But uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the recent history of, uh, of the European Central Bank, uh, last year, 2011, the ECB started uh, uh, purchases in the secondary markets, inter interventions in the secondary markets uh, of uh, Italy and Spain. And uh, following uh, the relaxation of uh, the government of, uh, of uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi as regards uh, the commitments undertaken in August last year, the ECB decided uh, later on in 2011 to uh, discontinue this, uh, these actions, these uh, interventions. And that's the, that's the lesson the ECB has learned uh, and I'm a non-voting member of the ECB Governing Council, and I can say that uh, while I'm not deciding on these issues, but I, I, ve I very well understand uh, why the ECB underlines uh, conditionality in this uh, context. It would be essentially our joint responsibility with the ECB to ensure effective and rigorous uh, conditionality through monitoring of uh, a country if there were to be a request uh, in the coming weeks or coming period. One final question, uh, you know, the, as you noted, uh, the debt levels are very, very high in some countries. Growth uh, is projected to be slow for a long time to come. Is it really realistic to not find some way to effectively write down debts more in the periphery countries? I mean, you can do it de facto, I guess, by giving them 40-year loans at a really low interest rate. Um, as some countries have been hoping, uh, but you know, it, is, it seems that so much of the language and the, in the plans is predicated on sort of evergreening things to just pretend you know we'll grow, they'll adjust, it'll go away. And I, I mean, I'm not sure how much experience bears out that that's necessarily going to happen. Uh, and. Uh, when do you feel that that issue would, if I'm wrong, when, when would that issue recede? In fact, uh, you're talking about Greece or? No, my, uh, we'll, we'll say it's senior bank debt in Ireland, you know, broader than that. Portugal. Well, the Euro area leaders have uh, very clearly stated that uh, Greece is uh, a specific uh, and unique uh, case. And uh, they have, uh, by their actions, uh, proven that uh, they are serious. Uh, in other words, uh, debt restructuring has been limited uh, to Greece, uh, where, uh, as we were preparing for the second program of Greece uh, in the end of uh, 2011 and uh, early 2012, uh, it 
was considered uh, necessary to go beyond uh, the first program because of uh, mm -hmm. concerns of uh, debt sustainability in order to have uh, the debt burden uh, down at 120% uh, of GDP by, by 2020. And um, it's uh, now premature to judge uh, anything about uh, the next steps uh, concerning the Greek program. I do not uh, envisage uh, further debt restructuring, but uh, I would not uh, want to dwell uh, too deep uh, on the Greek program now because we have uh, our mission partly on the ground, uh, partly now in the headquarters, uh, and soon returning back to Athens uh, to continue the talks. Uh, and they are at a very sensitive moment uh, for the moment, uh, so I would not uh, want to complicate things. Fair, uh, fair enough, fair enough. You have an extraordinary uh, audience here, and I guess if it's okay, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Sure. You might introduce yourself. But. Yes. I'm Ken Jones from Batson College. I'd like to follow up on the legitimacy question <coughs> by asking what is the view in the Commission regarding whether political legitimacy must precede the economic and adjustment ref uh, structural reforms, or whether you feel that it will follow, since uh, it seems that the democratic deficit has grown in Europe and is in inevitably leading now to antagonisms <coughs> among the members when transfers are involved and resentments grow from one country to another <coughs> as to whose fault it is and who's bailing out whom. What comes first, economic reforms or the democratic legitimacy? I do appreciate uh, the analytical clarity of your question <laughs> and the dualism, but uh, in real life, uh, especially as we are in, the, in a crisis situation, we cannot really separate the two. So we have to face uh, the situation as it is, uh, and uh, you are right, uh, it has meant that uh, unfortunately we have had uh, quite some divergence of uh, political discourses in Europe. Uh, you have, uh, in rough terms, you have uh, the creditor countries uh, discourse, you have the debtor countries discourse, you have the northern and uh, southern discourse. Uh, and uh, I see that uh, for every committed and responsible European, it is essential that uh, we try to preach these uh, political debates uh, and uh, try to avoid uh, Europe being being really seriously divided uh, because of this uh, current uh, crisis. That was not uh, the goal of the Euro, but uh, unfortunately we have had some negative spillovers uh, in the form of, uh, of uh, serious uh, political divides in, in Europe. I'm going to take a question from the back, uh, Philippe, if you can introduce yourself, if everyone can introduce themselves when they speak. I teach uh, in the economics department here at Harvard. Uh, I, w I wanted to get to a very prosaic question about the 3%. Uh, we know that the long-term uh, deficit uh, objectives of specifying the fiscal compact in the treaty are in structural terms, they are corrected but for the cycle. And in a sense, some people worry, you know, wonder why isn't the adjustment towards the long term, for example, the 3% objective <coughs> that sh should be met in 2030, also expressed in structure, you know, in terms that are adjusted for the cycle, especially given that growth in 2013 is likely to be very much lower than uh, the trend growth of uh, countries like France and other countries, or most countries in the, in, uh, in, in the so some people think it's inconsistent, other people think it can be recessionary because in order to meet the 3% nominal, you will need to make such adjustment that we, in fact we need to circumcompensate. And three, it may complicate the process of structural reforms. For example, uh, France I'm um, close to, I, I can tell you it will eat up the fiscal and political capital of this new government and nothing will be left to engage structural reforms. So the question is why, uh, why persist on the nominal 3%? In fact, uh, we are not uh, uh, only focusing on the nominal, nominal three percent. Uh, we are, and you are right, uh, the pact uh, should be interpreted and uh, applied so that uh, we focus on the structural fiscal effort. And in fact, if you look at uh, the past uh, couple of years' experience uh, during the, or after the crisis, uh, when we had to move towards uh, exit strategy from uh, fiscal stimulus uh, that was uh, in the course of 2010-2009. There was still uh, 
se active fiscal stimulus uh, while, uh, while 2010 uh, it was rather a move towards fiscal consolidation. That's an interesting example because we had uh, different countries in different positions uh, and our recommendations were different. Uh, basically three countries uh, or three groups of countries. Uh, first, uh, those that have uh, better fiscal space uh, the recommendation was to let uh, the automatic stabilizers uh, function fully. And that usually happened. Uh, second, uh, you had uh, the countries uh, uh, that uh, faced the challenges but were not uh, in, a, in an immediate crisis. Uh, and for them, uh, we recommended that they should uh, meet uh, the structural fiscal target. Uh, while then, uh, for the crisis countries, uh, we focused uh, rather on the nominal targets uh, because uh, there the question was perceived to be the confidence in the markets uh, and the confidence at the time was also dependent uh, on uh, the perception of uh, the capacity to start uh, cutting the fiscal deficit, which was uh, quite, uh, quite excessive in many cases. If you take Greece, for instance, uh, I've been sometimes wondering uh, um, because there have been some policy advice uh, that uh, Greece uh, should have had uh, a, uh, say, slower path of uh, fiscal adjustment. But if you look at the figures, uh, in 2009, after the revelations of uh, the statistics fraud, uh, it turned out that uh, the fiscal deficit was uh, 16%. Percent. And then, uh, after quite some effort, it was brought to, to around uh, 11% uh, 2010, 9% uh, 2011, and uh, now we are talking about uh, 6 or 7%. Percent. So my counter question is usually, should Greece uh, possibly have continu continued uh, with fiscal deficits of uh, 10 or 15%? Percent? I, I don't think so. I don't think the markets would have accepted that, uh, nor that uh, it would have been accepted uh, by the other euro area member states. Question, Eric. Kevin Featherstone, I'm a visiting scholar here at the, the centre. Picking mm -hmm. up your point about uh, the Greek case and going back to the points about conditionality and the uh, reform of governments, of course, the, the Greek case offers perhaps uh, lessons in terms of uh, domestic intervention. I wonder to what extent, looking back, you think that uh, the advice to Greece uh, could have perhaps been more in terms of making choices than across the board horizontal cuts. One of the criticisms perhaps one could make in the Greek early adjustment was of uh, horizontal across the board cuts with some savagery. Uh, would it have been better looking back to encourage, uh, to give a greater encouragement to choice and selectivity and priorities? In principle, yes, uh, especially if I knew what, what would have been the other alternative. And uh, it relates also to the relative weight of uh, fiscal reform and uh, structural reform. I recall uh, spring 2011, that's uh, more than one year, one year ago, and uh, that was about uh, the, the time of the first anniversary of the Greek uh, EU IMF program. And uh, then we looked at uh, the past year, and uh, it seemed that uh, Greece had actually met uh, the targets uh, in uh, fiscal policy rather well. But uh, there was uh, increasingly slippage from the structural reforms. Of course, in retrospect, uh, it would have been uh, much better for the Greeks that uh, the structural reforms uh, would have started uh, with uh, full dynamism and uh, with full effect uh, as soon as uh, possible, as soon as the program started. Uh, but for various reasons, uh, there was political resistance uh, from uh, different <coughs> political parties, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, trade unions, from, uh, from uh, other professional organizations. Uh, things uh, did not move as, uh, as expected. Uh, and this relates to the, to the second fact, which is that uh, I wondered for long why inflation stays uh, so high in Greece uh, 
and uh, why the unit labor costs uh, did not come down earlier. And I think uh, it must have uh, much to do with, uh, with a very rigid uh, economic structure and uh, vested interests uh, which uh, did not uh, enable this kind of uh, rapid, uh, more rapid uh, adjustment of uh, unit labor costs uh, and uh, related rate of uh, inflation. The good news is that uh, in the past year, and I'm, I'm not saying this, uh, this uh, because this coincides with, uh, with the start of uh, the government of Lucas Papademos, uh, but uh, since around those times, uh, we have seen uh, more serious structural reform, and we have also seen a reduction of uh, inflation rate uh, from around the beginning of this year in Greece. And uh, the unit labor costs have also come down. Uh, I checked uh, two weeks ago the statistics from the Bank of Greece, uh, minus 11% uh, for the whole economy and 14% uh, for, the, for the business sector. So the rebalancing is, uh, say, uh, intensifying. We all know from, uh, from uh, news stories and, uh, and uh, pictures uh, that uh, the political tensions are very difficult in Greece. Uh, but uh, I believe that Greece has uh, now a chance uh, to turn things around, uh, but uh, it really requires uh, now strong efforts uh, to come to terms with these, uh, these challenges of uh, structural nature. And one fact is also that uh, the export sector was relatively weak uh, compared to the excessive public sector or domest domestic economy and public sector. And even if you do rebalancing uh, in the classical, uh, say, IMF logic uh, with some European flavor, you may not succeed uh, in doing it as, uh, as fast as uh, you expected uh, if your, if your uh, domestic economy is uh, so much uh, larger in relation to your open sector or, or export economy. Question back here. Hello, my name is Marius Blachos, I'm a Victoria student at the Canadian School. Uh, in his article today, the director of the uh, Miguel Institute argues that outright monetary transactions program encourages a strong currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. So, whereas the Southern European states need a weak currency in order to boost growth and become more competitive and uh, outward looking. Uh, how are you going to address the problem if domestic deflation, uh, as, as domestic deflation might jeopardize the sustainability of the public debt of the European South and the member states of the European South? Well, I think uh, well, that's uh, that's certainly certainly a very important uh, important question. I would say that. Uh, if you look at uh, the policies that are being pursued, uh, pursued now, you can see that uh, in the so-called uh, deficit countries, uh, you have, uh, because of necessity, you have uh, more rapid uh, adjustment uh, going on than uh, in the surplus countries. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, um, say, uh, without uh, further compensatory measures, uh, of the kind that I described uh, concerning, for instance, uh, Germany. And uh, uh, if we would not take into account uh, the actions of, uh, of the ECB, we would uh, have a more, say, deflationary environment uh, in the European, European economy. I didn't quite get the first part. I didn't, I didn't uh, hear your first, first part of your question. Can you repeat the first part? The director of Bruegel argues that... Which Bruegel? Yes. Bruegel. Okay. Uh, argues that the, the outright monetary transaction program hmm. encourages a strong euro vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, whereas Southern Europe, like Spain, need a weak currency to avoid deflationary. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. How did he argue that uh, the OMT uh, encourages but a strong euro? I mean, I mean, I th I think, of course, there's at one hand a paradox that. In most places, when the, the monetary authority loosens, it makes the currency go down. And here, you know, the action was taken to take risk off the table, which is why it went up. There are plenty of action. There are actions they can take down the road following the Federal Reserve to make the currency weaker. I mean, I, you know, 
it wasn't like the euro doubled or something. I mean, I think it was a minor byproduct of uh, raising confidence. Yeah. So, yeah, if you if you look at what is really essential and uh, what is a byproduct, uh, I think uh, even if that were to be the byproduct, uh, the more essential thing is that uh, the ECB's actions uh, have helped uh, to restore confidence. Uh, now we have to stay the course and. Uh, Everybody has to do their job. Uh, member states uh, collectively have to take their responsibility. And uh, each and every member state uh, individually. And then it is up to each and every member state whether they request uh, a precautionary, for instance, a precautionary program, which uh, is a necessary condition for being eligible for the open market uh, transactions of the ECB. On the back. Hi, my name is Juan Tejas Andoval. Um, I am a master's in public policy student at the Kennedy School of Government, too. And my question is regarding the talk that has been happening for the last few years, where you can see all the Germanic countries' economy is going up, and the rest, or not the rest, of many of the other European members, such as the like, very peninsula, some of the Baltic ones, uh, some of these former Eastern European ones, uh, not going up as quickly. And so, you know, I don't know if long term this uh, trend is expected to continue, and if so, do you see this uh, like a problem or a niche that needs to be addressed? I'm usually quite uh, quite hesitant uh, to uh, accept uh, culturally based uh, explanations, uh, maybe partly because I'm trained in a, in a U.S. Uh, university and uh, that encourages uh, openness and uh, internationalism. And I face this, uh, this uh, kind of question quite often in the country I know best, uh, which is uh, Finland. Uh, maybe Finland has uh, problems now because it is not a Germanic country, it is a finno ugrian country. <laughs> Perhaps uh, that's the explanation. But more seriously, if you look at uh, the European economic and economic uh, policy history over the past uh, two or three decades, uh, you don't have to go even longer, but the uh, past uh, two or three decades, uh, what was the sick man of Europe uh, in uh, 1982? It was Denmark. I regret if, uh, if I offend any of my fellow Scandinavians, but uh, Denmark was the sick man of uh, Europe in 1982. It went into a what, the, what they call potato cure, uh, very rigorous uh, fiscal consolidation program, and uh, after three or four years, uh, Denmark uh, had to overcome its uh, fiscal crisis and started to, rec to uh, rebuild its, uh, its competitiveness. In the late 80s, early 90s, uh, it was a turn of uh, Finland and uh, Sweden Finland uh, almost went bust. Uh, I recall when I started uh, to work for the government in 1991, the economy was in a free fall of uh, minus 8 percent. Uh, and uh, it was a little miracle that uh, it was uh, possible to turn around uh, the economy in the by the mid-1990s. Uh, uh, Sweden likewise had a very serious uh, banking crisis uh, on top of its uh, fiscal crisis, which uh, had started already in the 1970s. What was the Sigman of Europe uh, in the cover of uh, The Economist in 2000? Germany. Germany. Ten years ago, just more than ten years ago, Germany was considered uh, the Sigman of uh, Europe. The Nether Netherlands uh, also in the 1980s, uh, very deep uh, fiscal crisis, uh, deep problems of uh, competitiveness. All these countries, uh, not to my mind, uh, because uh, they, are, they were predominantly Evangelic Lutheran or Calvinist. Uh, all these countries uh, had to go through, and Germany, by the way, is, uh, I think uh, you have more Catholics than, uh, than Lutherans, uh, by the way. So uh, all these countries went through a, a very serious uh, uh, reform of, uh, of uh, fiscal policy and uh, structural uh, elements uh, and were able to recover their uh, competitiveness. Uh, I think one lesson is that uh, there is never something eternal in uh, economic success or, or in economic policy. And I try to preach to my compatriots that uh, we have to continue with, uh, rather with a continuous reform, rather than only reforming when you have the, your back uh, against the wall. So the lesson is that uh, Greece, uh, Ireland, Portugal certainly have a chance. Hi, I'm, I'm Fazil Nishak, I'm a graduate at the Kennedy School. 
Um, I was struck by your comments um, uh, on your plans to mutualize sovereign risk. And it seems to me to, to mutualize sovereign risk is to mutualize sovereign debt. And you talked about it through public issues. In my mind, that's sort of tantamount to um, releasing euro bonds. And I want to know how you're going to convince a country like Germany, which is experiencing very good borrowing rates uh, because of low bond yields, and how they would actually have to now take a higher borrowing rate because of the euro bond and such countries. Like In fact, uh, as a as a side comment, uh, this uh, well, it's relevant to your question. The interest rates uh, that uh, Germany or the Netherlands uh, or Finland uh, have been paying recently are in fact uh, unnatural and uh, not a healthy phenomenon, because they are the they are the downside of uh, or they are the upside of the downside that they have to be financing the rescue operations in uh, in southern Europe. So it's linked to the imbalances that uh, I portrayed uh, in my in my opening remarks. So in that sense, uh, in a healthy European economy, in fact, uh, Germany would be paying uh, somewhat more for its uh, sovereign, de sovereign debt than it is, uh, it is doing for the moment. As regards how to persuade on this, uh, I think uh, we have actually uh, a uh, quite substantive debate uh, going on in Europe uh, on this. Uh, I would expect that uh, in the next uh, one or two years, uh, thinking of the political cycle, we have first the German elections in October 2013, and then we have the European elections uh, in uh, summer 2014. All the issues of uh, the Economic and Monetary Union, its rebuilding, political union, and uh, also the questions of uh, on, what's, on which conditions uh, could uh, mutualization of uh, public debt uh, make sense uh, for the whole of Europe. Uh, these issues uh, will be will be part of the core agenda of, uh, of the coming coming political debates. There have been some interesting uh, proposals uh, recently from uh, Proigel, for instance. Uh, it is called uh, blue bonds, uh, red bonds, uh, so that uh, you would go up to 60 percent limit uh, of uh, debt uh, with uh, euro bonds, and beyond that, uh, you would be on your own. So you would have a very strong incentive to reduce your debt. Uh, then there is another one, which is uh, in fact uh, presented by the by the German Council of uh, Economic Experts. Uh, the, the in Germany they call them uh, the wise persons, uh, five wise persons, uh, and uh, they done a very thorough study of uh, what is called uh, a debt redemption pact, uh, which combines uh, a uh, debt redemption, so, sorry, a uh, debt reduction compact uh, or agreement, uh, so conditionality, together with uh, a debt redemption fund, uh, which would uh, pool all the all the debt above 60 percent, uh, I mean, turning Proigel around, uh, pooling all the all the debt uh, above 60 percent, uh, and uh, you would access uh, these euro bonds uh, if you respected uh, the fiscal compact uh, and uh, you you practiced uh, fiscal rigor. That's a very interesting proposal. It comes from uh, the German government's uh, economic uh, advisors, uh, and it is quite prevalent in the, in the German debate uh, for the moment. So we might need a Hamiltonian moment in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and I just don't know. We don't have any, any capital to trade, uh, because you know the story of uh, the Yankee bonds or the, the American bonds. Uh, it was uh, the ass assumption of state debt uh, in 1790 in, in the United States of America by uh, the first Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton. And uh, he had uh, dinner together with uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson in New York. Uh, and uh, they made a deal which had uh, two parts. Uh, first, because uh, the South was then like the North in Europe. They were the creditor states, uh, Virginia and uh, others. So they had paid their debts from the War of Independence, uh, while the Northerners had uh, very heavy debts. Uh, so uh, they made a deal that uh, they do the assumption of state debts, uh, or they create a huge pool of, uh, of uh, bonds uh, securities uh, in order to stabilize the market, have a large liquid market, uh, have low rates, uh, credible, credible bonds. Uh, and uh, in, re in return, uh, 
Alexander Hamilton, who was a New Yorker himself, uh, agreed that uh, the capital will be transferred uh, to the swamps of uh, the Potomac River, <laughs> which is now called Washington. <laughs> so we don't have a capital to trade, uh, so um, <laughs> we have to change the context uh, by some other means. Uh, but I must say that uh, in the light of the past uh, 222 years of uh, historical experience of the United States of America, the U.S. has not done that bad uh, with uh, the federal economic government uh, created Give by us time. Uh, Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> That's in return for your 75 years, so thanks. Uh, I actually just had a little follow-on question to that uh, about mutualization, and it's, I apologize if this is more wonky, but um, the ECB is uh, going to propose that it would buy up the Periphery, secondary market, the periphery debt, but it says it's going to sterilize it. You don't have Yankee bonds, so you don't have a Euro bond. W I, I didn't exactly understand what they were going to sterilize it with. So in other words, if you're not going to have more money and you're printing money to buy the periphery country bonds, you have to be selling something up out in the market to soak it up. And I, w I wasn't quite understanding what that was. The ECB has, uh, has uh, plenty of uh, assets of uh, multiple nature. So uh, basically, in principle, it can uh, try to sterilize this uh, by selling assets, uh, selling, selling bonds of, uh, of uh, its portfolio. So Whether that, it, uh, the idea is it could do that for a while and then figure out what to do next if there wasn't enough. I would be very attractive to go into this discussion <laughs> because uh, you have uh, you have the let's say uh, you have the spoken word uh, and uh, spoken statements uh, and then yeah. you have uh, some other reality which uh, I will not dwell into. Okay, so fair that's, enough. That's fair fine. enough. I, I apologize. Um, no, but that's fine. That's your job. So. Mr. Ed, you mentioned something. Uh, I'm sorry. My name is Eleni Odoni. I'm an affiliate here at the center. Uh, you mentioned something about implementing disciplinary measures. I take it toward aberrant deficit performers. Um, as an overpunished Greek, I would like to know what you have in mind, or what, what were you talking about? I used uh, the euph euphemism of uh, enforcement mechanism. Yeah. I didn't spell out the word sanction from my That's mouth, uh, like neither disciplinary. So. so the enforcement mechanism uh, is essentially a preventive mechanism to avoid uh, member states uh, deviating from uh, the path of uh, sustainable public finances. It works better as a, really as a preventive than corrective instrument. Uh, and that's why, in fact, uh, Greece, uh, Portugal, and Ireland uh, are not part of the normal uh, excessive deficit procedures uh, and the sanction systems, uh, because, uh, in a way, the situation uh, was worse, uh, was, uh, was, so, was so bad uh, at the time when this uh, sy system was created that it ma made no sense to use it uh, and to worsen the situation. i give you another example, which is uh, proving the capacity of this uh, new economic governance to, to function. This entered into force November last year, 2011, and, uh, sorry, December, November, I sent letters to five finance ministers, uh, and we uh, we gave uh, them early warnings that uh, they are likely to breach uh, the fiscal deficit uh, limits uh, of three percent, uh, either 2011 or 2012. These countries were Belgium, Cyprus, uh, Hungary, Malta, and Poland. All of these countries, apart from Hungary, took. Uh, additional measures of uh, fiscal consolidation to meet the targets. Uh, Belgium is a good case in point. Uh, in Belgium, uh, as, the, as both uh, the politicians and especially the people were tired of uh, 500 days of uh, coalition talks uh, without uh, results, without the government. Uh, I mean Belgium was without government for, in the end, uh, 540 40 days. Uh, and Belgium faced a situation that uh, Either you, because of these sanctions, uh, you lose uh, 800 million euros, uh, or you save uh, 
something in the same scale, a bit less than 1 billion euros. That created, uh, that helped to concentrate minds uh, to uh, create a dynamic uh, which first led uh, to six political parties uh, agreeing on the budget. Uh, and then on that basis, uh, Prime Minister Elie de Rupo formed uh, the new government in, in January this year. And I bet we are going, going to see the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, uh, chain of events. Uh, well, they have a government now, but uh, same kind of budgetary talks uh, again uh, in uh, October, November, December with uh, Belgium. With Hungary, we took the decision then that uh, we would uh, suspend uh, the commitments uh, under the European Cohesion Fund, uh, which is uh, both politically and uh, to an extent economically important. Uh, this uh, suspension was lifted uh, during the summer because Hungary had taken the necessary measures to meet the fiscal targets uh, by the time. So it's essentially a preventive measure and uh, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland are not uh, in the normal way part of this uh, mechanism uh, until they, they uh, graduate from their programs. Uh, my name is Andrew Martin. I'm here at the center. Uh, I have a, a brief footnote and a question. The footnote is on the uh, sick, sick men of Europe in the 80s and 90s. Uh, in at least the Swedish case, and uh, we didn't mention the UK, but uh, Part of the uh, cure, the emergence from sickness, was uh, devaluation, dropping the, uh, uh, in the Swedish case, dropping the, the peg to the EQ, uh, in the, and in also the British case, uh, which was forced off in both cases. But uh, this was certainly part of the beginning of the rescue, uh, or of the recovery, and that obviously these are not options open to the, to the sick men of Europe, within the euro. Uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, if, if, if I remember your talk correctly, uh, I saw there was no there were no charts, nor was there men mention of unemployment. Uh, there was a chart about the declining deficits, uh, but there was no chart about the, the growing employment unemployment, which has reached uh, which has passed 25 million in the EU this past uh, summer, passing 11%, uh, saying nothing about the discouraged workers who were activated. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, younger people, younger people entering, trying to enter the uh, labor market and finding new jobs at the highest percentages there. Uh, are we content, is the EU content to have a succession of cohorts of young people unable to find jobs? Content to allow a loss of decade in terms of unemployment, the amount of time it's going to take to uh, reduce deficits to something according to sort of the target trajectory? What is the urgency about, un about unemployment and what, if there is some, uh, what has to happen in order to, re to reverse the upper trend on unemployment. Certainly, unemployment is uh, is uh, the most serious problem in Europe, uh, and uh, that's something that uh, nobody denies. Uh, but what is the cure to that? Uh, I don't believe, for instance, that uh, any breakup of uh, of the euro would be would be the cure for that. Uh, if that's what you suggest, uh, because of the consequences of, uh, of that uh, would be so uh, devastating and uh, so dramatic that uh, we would, uh, we would uh, immediately slump into a, a new economic, uh, deep economic recession in, in Europe. But I can see the logic, uh, what you say about uh, uh, devaluation. Um, if you take uh, the cases of, uh, for instance, uh, Latvia and uh, Ireland, uh, both countries uh, have uh, taken the route of uh, essentially of uh, internal devaluation. And uh, it is uh, bringing results uh, now in, uh, in the Irish case. Uh, they are returning to the markets. Uh, the economy is growing. And uh, in the case of uh, Latvia, 
we had uh, plenty of advice that uh, Latvia could not succeed uh, without uh, devaluation. Latvia decided uh, itself uh, it rather sticks to its uh, currency peg, as did uh, Estonia. Estonia was not uh, part of a program, but Estonia had a very serious economic recession as well in 2008-2009. Uh, Today Estonia is a member of the Euro, and uh, both countries' uh, e economies are focused to grow, even with, uh, with uh, slowing down in the world economy around uh, 4 to 5 percent uh, next year. Why I say this? Uh, because, uh, for instance, uh, for Estonia, the decision to stick to the currency peg uh, and uh, stick to its uh, objective of becoming a member of the euro in 2011 was essential in order to ensure foreign investment uh, and uh, to ensure that uh, the country has uh, a stable economic uh, environment. It was not easy, certainly, but both countries uh, have uh, passed the worst and uh, are now growing in a quite a solid uh, manner. My view from the economics, if you look at from the economics or economic history point of view, and uh, when looking at Europe uh, over the past uh, 25 years, uh, both as uh, a policymaker and, uh, and uh, a resting scholar, my conclusion is that uh, in the current uh, international economic environment, uh, if you have to choose uh, between three different uh, currency regimes, uh, you have uh, two choices which are, uh, which are meaningful, either a single currency or a floating exchange rate. Uh, but uh, I, would, uh, I would not go for, for a long period of time for uh, a fixed uh, exchange rate uh, uh, of which uh, we have uh, quite uh, negative experiences, for instance, uh, in the cases of, uh, of uh, Finland uh, and uh, Sweden and some other countries uh, from the 1990s. I just want to say we have Prime Minister Papademos here, and I'm wondering if you have anything you want to add to the conversation since we have the privilege of having you. Well, let me, let me thank you. Uh, let me first say that uh, it would not be a surprise if I say that I fully agree with the positions taken <laughs> by uh, Molly Ren, the general ones uh, concerning the future of Europe, uh, the need uh, to further uh, deepen and strengthen uh, the economic pillar economic and monetary union and an important step of that as he stressed is to proceed with uh, uh, the financial and supervisory integration. I think this is uh, very crucial because uh, it will help uh, break what uh, we call the adverse feedback between uh, capital markets, the bond market, the banking system and the real economy that has accentuated the crisis over the last uh, two years. Uh, I also fully agree and thank you for your kind words and what you said about uh, the Greek situation. I think one of the major shortcomings <coughs> in the case of Greece have been delays in the implementation of reforms, reforms that uh, uh, could uh, have contributed to supporting more, more economic growth. Uh, and improve uh, competition, not only competitiveness, that will help uh, restore uh, economic recovery uh, faster. Now, uh, having said uh, that, I think there is uh, one issue and one question that I would like to raise, which is uh, related also to the point that was made by the previous uh, speaker, uh, concerning uh, the need uh, to support the economic growth in the short term. I think both for the case of Greece as well as for the case of other countries, I think we both agree that the implementation of uh, reforms that would improve uh, uh, the supply side, competition and competitiveness are key. But these reforms take time uh, to have a result. And what we are observing now uh, in a number of countries, particularly in Greece, is that uh, uh, the shortage of liquidity in the banking system and, and reduced confidence have played uh, an important role in affecting the real economy. Uh, the weakness of the Greek economy over the last few years is not only a consequence, I would say it's only partly a consequence 
of the fiscal adjustment problem. But it's also a consequence of the shortage of liquidity, the outflow capital, which is uh, partly a result of what I before called uh, the adverse feedback between the banking system and the capital markets, uh, but also a result uh, of the enhanced uncertainty and low confidence that has led many Greeks to take the money outside. So unless we address some of these problems, it will be very difficult to achieve debt sustainability over the long term. And debt sustainability very much depends, as you very well know, not only on uh, the deficit path and the cost of financing, but depends crucially on the long term uh, growth. So as uh, we have discussed, and again, we agree on this very much, it is important to also undertake certain actions that will have to catalyze economic growth in the short term. I think this is relevant for Greece, but it's also relevant for other countries. So the question now that I would like to raise, I understand that uh, in uh, the European Union summit, and I think you mentioned this uh, earlier on in October, uh, there will be uh, a further discussions of proposals on how to stimulate uh, economic activity uh, in the short term. And uh, as fiscal consolidation, there's no doubt this in my mind, especially for the case of Greece, remains a top priority, but it's also important to support economic activity in the short term. What could we expect with regard to the timing of the implementation of measures at the European level that will help ensure that the projections for 2012 and 2013 uh, with regard to growth uh, will actually materialize and the dams risks uh, will not uh, I can very much, very much agree with your, with uh, the description you gave about uh, our European challenges and also, also the Greek, uh, Greek uh, uh, background. Uh, I think, by the way, one of the things uh, that has uh, been problematic uh, in the implementation of the Greek program has been the relatively weak uh, states, state of, uh, of public administration in Greece. Uh, and that's related also to, to uh, one project we worked quite, uh, quite intensively together, that's uh, how to make uh, the structure of funds uh, more focused uh, on gro growth-enhancing projects uh, and uh, ensuring uh, finance, uh, access to finance for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Because we, we have a in fact, uh, quite solid political decisions on those, uh, but uh, the implementation has been very slow and uh, has uh, not been as uh, effective and uh, impactful as we as we expected. Uh, because you are right that uh, in the Greek case, uh, like in uh, in the case of uh, some other countries, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, one of the most serious problems. Uh, for enterprises to grow is uh, is indeed uh, the tight financing conditions. Uh, so uh, that's why we created the task force uh, for Greece uh, a year ago. It is working uh, intensively, and uh, to my mind, uh, it is uh, starting now to bring results. Uh, but uh, it has not happened overnight. Uh, it has uh, taken taken some time. As regards uh, the decisions. Uh, of the October summit, I would actually refer to June summit uh, because uh, some important decisions were taken, including to increase uh, the capital base of uh, the European Investment Bank uh, so that uh, it could uh, better leverage uh, its, uh, its capital and uh, also stimulate uh, private uh, investment. Uh, this is now being implemented uh, and uh, it should have a relatively short-term impact because the EIB has a direct direct impact into the uh, into the real economy of uh, of Europe. And in the same way, in in fact, uh, Greece was the pilot case, uh, and uh, we we tried to multiply the actions of uh, using the structural funds uh, for facilitating better access to finance uh, for SMEs. Uh, Often, often through local, local or, or national banks, uh, because that's the effective channel. 
and uh, I would expect that uh, we will pursue this road uh, maybe even without uh, any any summit endorsement because we, we have basically the decis political decisions made uh, now it is a matter of uh, getting things done and uh, getting getting this in implemented I have time for just maybe one or two more questions. Uh, you've been patiently standing, so uh, please. So you mentioned the uh, competitiveness of Europe in general. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Mark Kosnik. I'm a student at Harvard Business School. Um, and um, I, just, I just wonder, because you're saying about fiscal measures you, you know, you're going to be taking towards the countries that are not meeting the objectives, my question would be, you know, do you think this, this is, is it possible for all 27 member states to run a balanced budget or, you know, to, to, to copy the German model of running a persistent trade surplus um, over a long period of time, given the fact that most of the trade within the European Union is actually within the European Union and between the member states. So, you know, isn't it the case of the fact that some countries, given the euro, given the structure, the European Union will remain uncompetitive and will have to subsidize them in the long term? In fact, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, Europe or the euro area in this context uh, is trading mostly in between itself. Uh, it's actually not exactly correct uh, because uh, I mean it's true that uh, the euro area is a very significant uh, trading area, and it's uh, and big part of uh, trade of uh, its members is uh, is done with other euro area countries. Uh, but uh, at the same time. Uh, the euro area fortunately trades uh, with the rest of the world uh, as well and uh, we did some simulations uh, we have done uh, repeatedly some simulations about uh, for instance uh, the impact of uh, fiscal stimulus of uh, x percent uh, in germany to um, economic growth in, in greece and uh, the correlation according to our models which we use for our normal forecasting and uh, econometric uh, work uh, is actually quite weak uh, and that's related to the to the reasons uh, I mentioned uh, previously it's more a structural issue than uh, than uh, anything else uh. but uh, I take it that uh, not every country can be can be having such kind of uh, high level of uh, current account uh, surplus uh, as uh, Germany has had uh, and uh, doesn't uh, have to have uh, and that's why, in fact, uh, my main point 